Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Back with me today is guest host, Dr. Elena Mucci. I have learned so much from her Instagram account, and I no longer have older loved ones I have to worry about. And all of the information I'm learning from her is going to help me age well. So that is part of the reason we're having these conversations. And today we are talking about common medications in older adults. So thanks for joining us again, Dr. Mucci. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So you said we're going to focus on blood pressure medications, diabetes, and dementia medications because those are the most common And if I understood correctly, if they're not prescribed appropriately, they can actually make dementia worse. That is correct. That is correct. And uh, exactly. And I'm happy to crack on with it. I know the time is limited. And uh, shall we get started with diabetic medications? Definitely. I don't know if I told you that my dad was diabetic and he had a kidney transplant in 2009 but he was one of those people that didn't, he did not take care of it well. Mm-hmm. And we all know what the end result with that, how, how that, what happens with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, with diabetes, uh, diabetes, of course, is divided into type one and type two and type one, when you are completely lacking insulin and usually it develops in younger patients. And from the very beginning, you are dependent on insulin injections, whereas type two diabetes is when your body is still producing a little bit of insulin, but uh, your body cells are not quite responding to your body's insulin. So we prescribe medications to help the body to respond to your own insulin. However, as the years go by with some patients, uh, the body stops responding to its own insulin, even with medications. And some type two diabetic patients end up going on insulin injections. And that is done with a Uh, purpose of controlling diabetes very tightly. As you've just rightly said, your dad ended up with a kidney transplant. Why? Because if you don't control your diabetes properly, you do end up damaging fine blood vessels of the body, which can lead to kidney failure and need for transplant, to brain disease, uh, to uh, strokes, to heart attacks, you name it. All the, the peripheral arterial disease, leg ulcers. So diabetes is can be quite nasty. However, what I observe in my older patients, as the years go by, and we do brilliant job, a lot of my patients do end up on insulin. But as they grow older, the need for insulin goes down. And that's Mm -hmm. what I would like to discuss. Because if this is not reviewed, the diabetes gets over treated the blood sugar levels go too low and people end up having what we call hypoglycemic attacks and collapse. And you see in all the patients with all the people, the hypos do not present the same way as with younger ones, younger ones, they feel like they're sweating and they become very nauseous and they know when they need to take their sugar. And uh, with all the people, the hypos can present with, Memory problems, memory decline, Mm -hmm. worsening of their dementia, falls. You see very, very non-specific presentations. So um, over-treated diabetes in all the population is becoming a huge problem. And especially with dementia patients, we have enough evidence out there showing that over-treatment of diabetes can lead to new memory problems or deterioration of dementia in patients with already known dementia. Interesting. Because my dad seemed fine, not well, but his mind seemed fine until November 29th, 2016. We went to spend time with my parents, decorate the house for the holidays. My husband walked in the door and my dad said, so how's the credit union business treating you? And my husband his heart dropped because he hadn't been in the credit union business in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so he knew something was desperately wrong. 
And had I known what was actually going on, I, I hope I would have been smart enough to call hospice instead of the trauma route that we went where he was in the hospital for 32 days and then he was home on hospice and, or well, then he was home yeah. and he fell and then he <laughs> back in the hospital and then he came home on hospice. Mm. It was mm. not a lovely time. Not, not at all. Not at all. And Jenny, why these things happen? Why do they, all the patients, all the people, um, get the hypos how come their diabetes which was beautifully controlled years ago becomes over treated and the key we are talking of course about type 2 diabetic patients the key to understanding is is to understand the physiology as we age especially with older adults you know problems with dentures problems with appetite number of other medical concerns they don't eat that much inevitably as the years go by a lot of us will be losing weight and as the weight goes down the fat tissue goes away and our own body cells suddenly open up and respond now to the little insulin your body still produces with type 2 diabetes and the need for insulin actually diminishes. So it is so important, uh, especially with patients with dementia, with in patients with known memory concerns, if they are type 2 diabetics and they're on insulin, to one, discuss with their primary care physician what are their target diabetic levels are because the targets uh, get increased. You see, as we, in all the population, the targets for diabetic, diabetic control are not the same as it would be in younger population. So they need to get that figure, have the medicines reviewed. And I personally uh, end up in my practice taking a lot of older patients off their insulin and adjusting their tablets. And of course, you will appreciate this makes everyone's life so much easier, uh, especially with memory problems, injecting the insulin, causing the pain, people not understanding why they're actually being injected and prickled with those needles and hurt. Managing the diabetes for their loved ones becomes easier. So there are a lot of implications. But the main one, of course, is I'd like to emphasize over treatment of diabetes can lead to worsening memory problems, worsening dementia. So if we have a loved one with diabetes and they are losing weight, then we that should be a definite clue to have their medications reevaluated? Definitely. From all sorts of perspectives, all medicines, really, because a lot of medicines are prescribed as per body weight. And I'll talk about the very simple one, which is paracetamol. You call it in America amphetamine? Oh, yeah. Um, acetaminophen. Aspirin. Uh, yes. Acetaminophen. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I okay. should know. Acetaminophen. Uh, we call it here across the ocean paracetamol. So usually it is, it is prescribed in a dose of one gram four times a day. But if your body weight is below 50 kilograms, that should the dose should be halved. Otherwise, you will be at risk of actually having the overdose. So that's a simple example with a drug which is used on day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's so commonly used, isn't it, as a painkiller? Uh, but it, the same true about many other medications, including diabetes. But as I said, with diabetes, the mechanism is a little bit different. Uh, physiological and disease-related decline, which leads to weight loss as we grow older, makes our body cells more responsive to our own insulin, which we still produce as type 2 diabetics. Of course, it is all should be very, very closely monitored. But uh, to our listeners, if you have a loved one with type 2 diabetes who years ago ended uh, on insulin to have a better control of their diabetes, and now they're in their 80s, 90s with memory problems, please review their need for that insulin. Maybe there is no need anymore. Which would be nice. I think my dad was a challenge on evaluating his medications because he didn't, he didn't eat the way he was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And he didn't exercise, so that leads me to my next question. When we lose body weight, you said when you lose fat tissue, our bodies may respond to our own insulin, um, not projection, but production. Yeah. What happens if you lose muscle mass? Because my dad was not 
thin. He wasn't losing weight, but he definitely was losing muscle because he wasn't active because he was always in pain. Um, I, I'm not aware that that has major difference, really. I mean, the mechanism, as I explained, it, it is that losing the fat makes the tissues more, uh, cells more responsive to the insulin. When it comes to losing the muscle bulk, we are talking about overall weight, which you have to be aware of whenever medicines are prescribed generally. Okie dokie. That's kind of what I assumed, but I thought I'd throw it out there just because mm. I know what a challenge he was. <laughs> It's, mm, he mm. he was not an easy patient. I know that. And what, was he type one or type two, Jenny? Type two. He was a type two diabetic, and he was he on insulin. Mm -hmm. Yes, he, he was on insulin. Well, that that's a typical example, isn't it? Uh, that that usually the type two diabetic m m patients, majority of them are managed with tablets, uh, but some of them to get a better control of diabetes do end up taking insulin. So that's something which obviously needs to be addressed when you get older, the convenience of the insulins and whether it's required really. I think he was on tablets and injections. But that's right. That's right. Okay. That's usual. That's usual. Okay. So the tablets are initiated to start with in type 2 diabetics and insulin is added if the control of diabetes is still poorly while they are on tablets. So insulin comes usually last. Well, he's so definitely didn't we, control it well. So, <laughs> so if, if diabetes is a bit over-treated and we take people off insulin, they still continue on their tablets usually. That's good to know. Fortunately, he is pretty much the only older adult I've had to deal with that was on medications. Even mm. my paternal grandmother wasn't on much of anything. My mom was not. She was just on the Alzheimer's medication. So other than, mm -hmm. my dad took all the medications for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he was on too much. Yeah. It's yeah. just, ugh. He, he's a good example of why we don't, we want to take care of our health because the cocktail of pharmaceuticals he was on, it was, it was a management nightmare to begin with. And I have no, nobody knows how all that stuff interacted with each other. So uh, do you know, I would have loved your dad as a patient. There is nothing more satisfying for me is to get a patient with a large list of medications and it's a difficult process. Don't take me wrong. It is not about going there and just crossing everything <laughs> off. It doesn't work that way. But meticulous um, review of every medicine, indications, the doses, the interactions. I feel like Sherlock Holmes, you know, deep riding <laughs> through these medications, finding the connections, deciding whether you still need this or that, replacing them. So it can take to do a proper medication review on a complex patient can actually take good two, three hours. Wow. Well, if I could find his list of medications, maybe one, I don't know that we still have it, but I will send it to you as a... Uh, definitely. As a, I'd love, I'd love to make it, to have a look at it. <laughs> I'll ask my husband if, my husband never gets rid of emails or things, so he may have a copy, but yeah, my dad kept a spreadsheet of what he was on and the doses and it was not, I'm not into medications. I, I prefer to do things as natural as possible when that's appropriate. And I don't do spreadsheets because I'm an artist. So his spreadsheet <laughs> for his meds was not my thing. <laughs> mm. So definitely that is, that is really helpful information right there. Mm -hmm. Is that the, I don't have any more questions on the di on the insulin, and the diabetic medications. Does that lead shall, us shall, into yeah, uh, blood we pressure? To blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. So blood pressure, again, it's a very interesting one. A day not passing by without me stopping someone's blood pressure medications. Exactly the same story as with diabetes. Patients take blood pressure medications throughout their lives and a, a, a strict control of blood pressure prevents kidney disease, prevents strokes, prevents heart attacks. I cannot emphasize the importance of a tight blood pressure control and being compliant with your medications. Because if you miss a tablet, blood pressure can shoot up and that can lead to an acute stroke. But 
as we grow older, various other things happen in the body and the body responds differently to medications. And actually with some medical conditions, the blood pressure goes down itself. So let's say you are someone in your 50s, 60s, 70s benefiting from blood pressure medication. They saved your life. They prolonged your life. You now ended up as an 80, 90 year old with memory concerns. You might have Parkinson's disease and you might be on Parkinson's medications. And of course, we know Parkinson's and Parkinson's medications lower your blood pressure. Did you know that, Jenny? No, I did not. Yeah, with Parkinson's, a lot of patients actually have too low blood pressure. And uh, there are many other neurological conditions with their heart conditions. If your heart is not pumping properly, um, that can lead to a low blood pressure. So there are a number of uh, situations where patients benefited from the high blood, uh, sorry, for blood blood pressure lowering medications. but, But as they get into their 80s and 90s, again, blood pressure targets change. If you are someone in your 60s, your blood pressure target should be around 120 over 80, especially if you have diabetes, for example. If you are someone in your 80s or 90s, your blood pressure target has changed now. And in UK, NICE guidelines, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, you might have heard of NICE, which helps us doctors uh, in our practice. The target is 150 over 90. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Why this is done? The reason is simple, because of neurological changes in the body. When we stand up, Let me demonstrate this to you, Jenny. It's very simple to understand. So I stood up now. All the blood is now flushing down. But various processes kicking in my body and uh, constrict the blood vessels. My heart is now going a bit faster. And all these processes stop the blood pulling down into my legs. And if the blood pulls into my legs, what will happen to my brain? there won't be enough blood going to the brain and I will collapse, okay? So did I collapse, Jenny? No. No, I didn't because I have healthy responses in my body. All my blood vessels are constricted now. The heart is going a bit faster and the blood is flowing back and continues perfusing my brain. So these mechanisms, these compensatory mechanisms in all the adults are altered especially if they end up on various medications. If you are a lot of blood, blood pressure medications are in fact dilating blood vessels. A lot of heart medications, in fact, slow down your heart rate. So when they stand up, they don't have those mechanisms to stop the blood flushing down and they experience dizzy spells. And in some cases, when the blood pressure gets too low, the dizzy spell can lead to a full fractured hip, hospital admission, and we know what happens to these patients. If especially you are someone quite elderly with memory concerns, I'm sorry to say uh, it's, it's very well known the fractured hip could be the beginning of the end. Yep. So I've been, that been is there. Why, yeah, you've been there. We've discussed this before. That is why in all the adults, we keep the blood pressure a bit higher. So when you do stand up and the blood pressure does go down, it doesn't go down low enough to starve your brain of perfusion of blood. So you are providing a little bit of a cushion. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And it is always a balancing act. Of course, it is a balancing act. You are balancing the risk of a bit higher blood pressure and risk of stroke, which comes with a higher blood pressure against keeping the blood pressure um, on the lower side, uh, but risking a dizzy spell, fall and fractured hip. Again, all of this is coming from multiple um, clinical research trials, which show that Uh, low blood pressure, lower blood pressure in elderly patients, especially those with memory concerns and uh, dependent uh, on others for their activities of daily living. Um, The so-called normal blood pressure, in fact, 
associated with higher death rate. That is really interesting. Traditionally, my family has low blood pressure, not a problem low, but now I'm, I'm kind of wondering about my paternal grandmother because she always had low blood pressure. I'm wondering, hmm, I'm curious as to what it was before she died. It's interesting. But it does remind me of when I started doing the indoor cycle classes and my bottom was killing me from the bike seat. So I would stand up and your heart just pounds so much harder. You feel like you're going to die. So then you sit down and your bottom hurts. <laughs> and it's like, but if you wear a, a heart rate monitor, you can see the difference between standing up and sitting down and transitioning on the monitor. You, your blood pressure does change as you stand up or sit down. It's oh, really interesting. Definitely. definitely. It's interesting. You mentioned the monitors, Jenny, because we, um, the latest guidelines we in fact had from nice, um, in 2019 indicated that in all the adults, again, over the age of 80, especially those with diabetes, we need to treat standing blood pressure. So, you need to do lying blood pressure and then standing blood pressure because the lying blood pressure is one figure. And because of all these changes in our body, the standing blood pressure could be too low. And then if you treat the lying blood pressure, you will get the standing blood pressure even lower and lead to the dizzy spells and falls. So in ideal world, the way I manage my patients is I will lay them down for 15, 20 minutes. I'll take a blood pressure. Then I'll stand them up for a couple of minutes, take the blood pressure again. And let's say the lying blood pressure was 180 over 100. Seems quite a high blood pressure, right? It is very yeah. high. Anyone will tell you a very high. And it is very easy for that patient to end up on blood pressure medication. But if I do a standing blood pressure, and it drops down to 150 over 90. Now, my patient is actually now within the targets for that. He's 80 plus years old. He has diabetes, might have a little bit of memory problems. He's dropping his standing blood pressure. It's 150 over 90, which is within the targets acceptable for that patient. So if I give him blood pressure medications, it will drop even lower and it will be too dangerous. So that patient with a line blood pressure of 180 over 100 will not be treated. That's interesting. Would you factor in how sedentary their lifestyle is? Because I would think if they were reasonably active for their age, you wouldn't want to give them the blood pressure medicine because their standing blood pressure would be fine. But if they are very sedentary, maybe it's not fine. Uh, well, that, that in, it's interesting you said that. Um, so if I have a very active individual, that individual very unlikely to fall in the category of frailty we are talking about here. So if that individual more or less sedentary, then is probably no one chooses to be that way. There are probably problems there. They can't mobilize properly and so on. So that person does have a degree of frailty and will benefit from having their blood pressure kept on the higher side. It, it is so individual, um, Jenny. It is so individual. But as a geriatrician, of course, what I'm dealing with day in and day, day out, falls. Falls. Uh, about 50, I would say 60 to 70% of presentations to hospital, to my ward, are patients with falls. Of course, the falls are multifactorial. You can never say, well, it was caused by blood pressure medicine. It's contributing. The falls are multifactorial. And unless you actually look at every factor which led to the fall, you will not be able to stop them falling. And blood pressure medicine can be just that contributing factor, which if we address, we might reduce the risk of the falls. Which we all know is very important. Mm. Falling is just, it's no fun no matter what age you're at. 
but it's oh it's a, a, absolutely absolutely but you see when you fall at a quite a, a older age and you have a degree of memory concerns and frailty apart from the fall what happens to these individuals jenny they develop anxiety over future falls so that fall scares them so much that they deliberately stop mobilizing and that's such a dangerous thing to happen because if you had a fall and you are so not so scared you stop going out stop mobilizing you decondition even more you lose your muscle bulk you get even weaker and you increase the risk of fall just by doing that so it's important not to prevent the falls in the first place number two to address the causes which led to the fall do counseling and reassure the individual saying look you fell because of one, two, three. And look what I've done. I've corrected these factors. So nothing to be scared for. Go and have a little bit of rehabilitation. Get your physiotherapist to help you to get your balance back and good to go. I just love that. That's I can see the the relief that an older person would get when you tell them that. Tell and them that's... why. Absolutely. My God. Abs why? It's no good saying, well, you are you are 92. Well, what do you expect? <laughs> uh, Jenny, you would not believe I had a 92-year-old patient today and uh, he has Parkinson's disease and he has swallowing difficulties, which a lot of Parkinson's patients get, of course. He has speech problems. He had Parkinson's for eight years. And everybody made assumptions that probably this is a deterioration of his Parkinson's and then he was referred to my clinic and I examined him and it wasn't until um, and he he kept closing his right eye uh, and nobody knew why nobody asked him why and I said why are you closing your right eye he said I'm seeing double I've been oh, wow. having double vision for the last few months and then you, you know, I went more into the history, and there is much more going on than just Parkinson's disease. So every little clue is important. That is just fascinating because I love mysteries, and so you're you're solving medical mysteries, which I just love, <laughs> and you're helping oh, us to le learn how to age well and take care of aging loved ones in a better manner. So this is this is super fantastic. I just love. See, I've said it before. I learn a lot from you and <laughs> it helps me process what's going on with aging loved ones. And it helps mm. me know what questions to ask of my own physician and, mm. and my husband to ask of his so that we can age well, so that we can get to 103 like my grandmother did. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, I'm happy to stop on a couple of uh, blood pressure medications. Uh, do you remember we wanted to maybe touch in on individual blood pressure medications, which are commonly used? And I won't stop here for too long, but the commonly used medications are the likes of amlodipine. These are calcium channel blockers. Um, lodipine, nifedipine, felodipine, they're all dipines. So, um, and one of the common side effects of these medications is ankle swelling. And it, it is very well known side effect. And what do I see, Jenny? The patients develop a, a, an ankle swelling. They go to see another uh, doctor because in nowadays and age, it's very difficult to, to see the same doctor twice, isn't it? Yes. Um, and they end up on a water medicine for the ankle swelling. So it's a, I say a lot of prescribing cascades. We call them prescribing cascades. You end up with a medicine. You develop a side effect from that medicine. You go and see your doctor. It might not be the doctor who started the first medicine. And the second doctor gives you medicine to treat the side effect, the first medicine. And so it goes on. And, um, see that every day as well so unpicking that is important as well beware of prescribing cascades yeah that's what happened to my dad blood pressure medication the common one is amlodipine all those dipines calcium channel blockers calling causing ankle swelling and patients ending up on water medicines the likes of lasix frusamide um, to treat their ankle swelling what is it what, how would you treat the ankle swelling from the medicine 
without just stop it jenny just stop that medicine recognize the side effects stop it and treat your patient with another blood pressure medicine got it okay yeah it's it's as simple as that and of course we have um the likes of ramipril perindopril uh, they can cause dry cough so that that's a known side effect of these medications i mean the list goes on the so-called beta blockers bisoprolol, carvedilol, atenolol, uh, they are there to treat angina, they are there to treat blood pressure, but in all the patients, in all the people, they are very poorly tolerated. They make them feel tired and really they should be avoided in diabetes and they can make you make your heart go too slow. So every single one of them has to be scrutinized. I advise routine medication review when you are getting to that age where you have multiple medical conditions, seeing many doctors, ended up on a number of medicines and quite a bit of polypharmacy. Find a doctor who can have a look at you holistically, take you under their umbrella and do the medicines review for you every six months. That's not too much to ask. Maybe finding the doctor that can be the umbrella. That might be the biggest challenge. <laughs> it can be a pharmacist as well. I think we totally underutilize pharmacists. I mean, these are patients. They're, they're, it's a, pharmacists know their medicines. They know interactions even better than doctors do. There are a lot of clinical pharmacists out there whose interest is polypharmacy. So it could be a doctor or pharmacists or even a nurse. There are a lot of nurse, specialist nurse prescribers. So just finding the right specialist for you. So it sounds like you should definitely get to know your your personal pharmacist wherever you have your medications dispensed. Absolutely. And if you came from seeing another physician and ended up with a new medicine, take that medicine and go and see your nurse, pharmacist, or prim primary care doc. Sit down and look at all your other medications and make sure that there are no interactions. Because the doctor who prescribed that medicine, it could be a single organ specialist. He's only seen his organ whether it's a heart, kidney, stomach. So they won't have the time to go through your other 20 medications. So you need someone to do that work for you. See, that's really good advice because I think with digital medical records that all of the doctors and hospitals, et cetera, can access about you, although that never seems to be 100% accurate, I believe most people think, well, they're looking at everything I'm taking, so this must be fine. And you're saying, no, you need to make sure that anything new, you run it past your pharmacist or your general physician. I think that's excellent. See, there's that tidbit that everybody needs to keep in mind. Yeah, a tip. Yeah. Yeah. Top tip. So now we're going to go on to dementia medications. Dementia medications. Yes. Very important. And that is why I left it to the last Usually, you see, where in, le in, in discussions like this, you remember the last point, don't you? <laughs> that is the true. Retention, the retention of the information. I, I read statistics somewhere that um, in the first hour, you sort of remember 50%. By the end of the week, it's only 10% of the information. Anyhow, so dementia medications. A lot of our patients with dementia are taking dementia medications and I'd like to take a minute to explain what exactly they do. So a chemical messenger in our body called acetylcholine is responsible for memory and learning. Acetylcholine. So it's a chemical messenger and the current treatment around dementia is based on boosting the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. So the likes of Aricept, and we will just use Aricept or Donepezil, very commonly used dementia medication as an example. The job of this medication is to boost the amount of acetylcholine. It is doing so by inhibiting the enzyme which metabolizes acetylcholine. So that's what it does. <laughs> What we now need to discuss is that there are so many medicines out there which have completely opposing mode of action. They work by reducing the amount of acetylcholine in the body. 
And Jenny, I'm coming to it now. How often do you think I, I see dementia, medica- dementia patients, patients with dementia come into hospital, you look at their drug chart and they are on our recept, which increases the amount of acetylcholine on their brain. And underneath our recept is a medication which reduces the amount of acetylcholine on the brain, completely opposing modes of action. And you instantly know that whoever's done the prescription, maybe clinical pharmacology wasn't their strongest part in medical school, shall we say. (laughs) That sounds Uh, like a positive way of putting it. (laughs) uh, This happens too often. And of course, in the world of dementia specialists, we know that we should, those medications which reduce the amount of acetylcholine, they are known as anticholinergic medications. And you might have come across that term. And uh, it is very well known fact that anticholinergic medications should be avoided in patients with memory concerns, if possible at all. And in our day and age, we have many other alternatives. Sometimes it might be impossible to avoid them as long as we don't end up prescribing several of them. So the the commonly uh, used ones in our population are the continence medicines. And we discussed continence with you Um, a few weeks ago. So the medications which are used to call to treat overactive bladder continence problems or incontinence problems, in fact, have anticholinergic side effect. They suppress the amount of acetylcholine and should be avoided in older patients. But they are very commonly prescribed along with Aricept, which increases the amount. So the drugs which are used for continence um, and a lot of our listeners might recognize these are tolteradine, oxybutynin, darifenosin, solifenosin. There are others, but these are the most commonly used ones. And of course, Jenny, the, some of them are newer than the others, and the pharmaceutical companies will tell you that their drug does not cause confusion, their drug does not cross blood-brain barrier, and more specific for the bladder. What they forget is in their clinical trials, how many nursing home patients did they recruit into their clinical trials who suffer with various degrees of dementia? Our, my day-to-day patients are not represented in those clinical trials. Also, these medicines might not cause confusion on their own, but we've just discussed our patients end up with many medications which might also have that anticholinergic side effect. So when they're combined all together, I'm sorry to say they do cause confusion. And once or twice a year, Jenny, I cure dementia. Mm -hmm. How often do you think as a geriatrician, I cure anyone? I have Mm -hmm. to accept. I look after patients in their 90s and their very late 90s, 100-year-olds. Uh, we have to be realistic. In my clinical practice, a lot is about making their life easier, improving their quality of life and making it a bit tolerable for them. There are a few conditions where I can claim I cured them, but there are very few. So once or twice a year, when I do a thorough medication review and take my patient with dementia off all those anticholinergic medications, suddenly it turns out that they don't actually have dementia or they had only mild dementia or mild cognitive impairment, but the medications made them so bad that they came across as having quite a a severe dementia. So that's how important it is. And when we're talking about anticholinergics, I only touched on memory there. They have many other side effects, which can be very upsetting. Urinary retention, constipation, Dry mouse is really bad one as well. So yeah, that, that's a really bad side effect. Very bad side effect. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, reduced eating and drinking. Yeah, if you have dry mouth, you might not have appetite. You might not be able to eat your food properly. So I, I can go on about anticholinergics, but my God, I cannot emphasize the importance of looking at anticholinergic burden in patients, anticholinergic burden in terms of medicines in patients with memory concerns, especially those who are, in fact, on the likes of Arisept. 
So do not look at individual medication, look at the overall burden. The other important anticholinergics, uh, which uh, I, uh, our patients with dementia end up using is amitriptyline, nortriptyline. These are old fashioned antidepressants with quite potent anticholinergic properties, making people confused. So this, I thought I'll mention these two, but a lot of medications which we use might have mild anticholinergic properties like warfarin, who would have thought? Digoxin used for heart condition, even the water medicine, furosemide, you know, they all have. So when you end up on number of those, suddenly, even though every single one have just mild anticholinergic side effect, amalgamation of the lot becomes too much for that brain and people go confused and we think that they're demented. That's amazing. It's interesting. My husband ended up with blood clots in his lungs two years ago, almost two years ago. They don't know what caused them. And he was on warfarin for a long time. And now I'm wondering, I'm going to have to think back and see. He doesn't remember a lot about that time. He seems to have like slight gaps. And now I know why. Because it just affected him. Because he was on pretty high dose for a while because he's a big guy. That's He's going to be, I'll have to make him listen. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question regarding the um the Alzheimer's medication and I can't remember the name of it. I'm terrible, but you mentioned it. Aricept, Donazepil, is that the other one? Donepezil, it's the that same one. as Aricept. So Donepezil is the dementia medication. Aricept is a brand name for Donepezil. It's okay. they are the same things. Okay. But there is also Rivastigmin. There are three of them, which we use on a galantamine and rivastigmine and donepezil are the three most, the three dementia medications which we are using. Is there any truth to the, I, I've read and I've been told that about after five years of being on that medication, the, they need to be reevaluated because sometimes it makes the, not the symptoms, but the it makes a lot of what's going on with the Alzheimer's progression actually worse. And sometimes taking them off of it is better. But when I asked my mom's neurologist about that, she told me, no, that wasn't true. So I'm not sure what to believe. Is it well, individualized like everything else? <laughs> uh, well, no, Jenny, I'd say that's not true. It's not making their dementia symptoms worse. So let me try to break it into um, your question is quite interesting. So Again, here in uh, UK, uh, we are using the Aricep, Donepezil, for mild to moderate dementia. When the person moves into the later stages of dementia, the severe dementia, they develop behavioral problems, the Donepezil doesn't appear to be that useful anymore. It doesn't make dementia worse. It just becomes useless. It's just an extra pill you are taking for no good reason. It's not helping you anymore. So we tend to switch from Donepezil to Memantin. Memantin is another dementia medication. And here in UK, we are using it for severe dementia, especially in patients with behavioral problems. Some patients can be on both. Donepezil and memantin, let's say if their, their dementia is not that bad, but they already have uh, behavioral problems, memantin show, has shown to help that. So they might be on both. So no, they do not make dementia symptoms worse. They just stop working. And when you come to the last stages of dementia, when the patient is entering the end of life care stages of their disease, all this medication should be discontinued anyway. So I think that's that that that's what's happening. And let's face it, donepezil, it's a medication. As I said, it increases the amount of acetylcholine on the brain. And by doing so, it's got it on, its own side effects. It causes uh, upset stomach. It can cause diarrhea. It can make your heart go slow. And uh, again, once or twice a year, some of my uh, dementia patients actually end up with pacemakers, Jenny. Uh, because I still want to give the medicine, but it makes their heart to go too slow. So I have to put a pacemaker to get the heart going so I can continue the medicine. So we need to be aware of these side effects. My goodness, it's definitely complicated. 
Oh, it is very, it's fascinating at the same time. <laughs> that is true too. I, like I said, I've learned so much and it's, you know, you'd think, oh, why would I want to listen to somebody talk about, you know, medications in older adults? And it's like, this is why, because you learn things that maybe you need to know right now, maybe you need to know later on. Well, and uh, our listeners, there will be so many with, the lo with their loved one being uh, having dementia and having a, for example, being on a dementia medication. This knowledge of knowing that dementia medication can make the heart too slow and slow heart beat, slow heart beat can cause dizzy spells, can cause low blood pressure. It can make their loved ones to have recurrent falls and being a bit more muddled. They would know why. And as I said, it's a, a simple um, ECG, electrocardiogram, will show that what we call bradycardia, slow heart rate, and will lead to diagnosis. And there is a remedy, isn't it? There is a remedy. You do a pacemaker, if the person can tolerate it, of course, and or if you can't do a pacemaker, we stop donepezil. We stop donepezil and give memantin instead, which doesn't have those side effects. So very important to know. I mean, I say, uh, I don't know whether you've seen my YouTube channel, um, Jenny, mm -hmm. but it's called Be Your Own Doctor. And um, I will be very happy if you put a link somewhere to my YouTube channel there. Because Definitely. it is designed for our listeners. It is not for doctors. It is not for medical professionals. It is for people to understand their medicines. And I'm teaching Be Your Own Doctor. Well, we'll definitely link that in the show notes and mm -hmm. you'll be able to watch this on YouTube and we'll, I'll have the editor fix it so they can click over to your episode. Yeah. I want to, I'll ask anyway. I don't, I'm not good at that. So I don't know if that's all, an option between channels, but we'll see what we can do. Definitely be linked in the show notes so people can go find it. And I know there's lots of interesting topics that you're covering over there because mm. if you're not following Elena, on Instagram, you are missing out on some very quick, easy, digestible information on all things for older adults, aging well. That's how we found each other. And I'm always fascinated by everything that she's posting. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. More to I've come. not seen any doctors in the U.S. doing TikTok and Instagram reels. <laughs> <laughs> she's the hip doctor. So is there any last minute, last bit of information on medications before I let you go into the evening? I want to share with you a story uh, of a patient I saw today. So you can have dementia and you can be beautifully controlled on your medications. I saw him two years ago um, for a general review and nothing's wrong with him. His family requested another review two years later just to make sure everything is fine. And there has been, he was 86 then, he's 88 now. There has been no decline whatsoever. So with dementia medications, the research is quite clear. We do not expect a dramatic improvement. Uh, we have to be honest about it. We have to be honest with our listeners having your loved one on dementia medication doesn't mean that they're suddenly going to be back to normal. Dementia medications do not do that. Their job is maybe to improve you a little bit, um, but the main job is to slow down the progression a little bit. And it's done an amazing job in this individual. I was delighted to see him looking really well and having a tennis match planned with his son for the afternoon. Oh, that is wonderful. Tennis at 88 is a, that's a goal we should all strive for. Or some I form asked of... his son to go easy on his dad. <laughs> <laughs> Let dad win, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful. And that sounds like a beautiful place to stop for today. Do we know what we're talking about next month? I don't, Jenny. <laughs> that's <laughs> so embarrassing. That, oh, that's okay. We will figure it out before we record again. So I really appreciate this. All the listeners definitely check out Dr. Mucci's YouTube channel, her Instagram account. You will not be sorry that you did that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. <laughs>